Welcome everybody. This is the Gurney Village Board Committee of the Whole meeting for October 28th, 2019. Mayor Kavarik is out of town, so I am pinch hitting for her tonight. If we could uh, take a um, roll call, please. Thorstenson. Here. Ross. Here. Garner. Here. O'Brien. Present. Thomas. Present. Hood. Here. Six present. We all right, stand together and pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So tonight, with it being uh, a committee of the whole, uh, we're a little bit more less formal. Uh, but for the first item on our list is that we have a report from Maureen Reedy, the president to visit Lake County, and she's also brought a, a few guests with her as well. So, uh, Maureen, how would you like to, would you like to go and um, use the yes. microphone? Is yes, that, please. Is that mic or wireless? Yeah, we need the handheld. It's, it's right here in the middle. Maureen, tonight we'll give an update of what's going on, and as she always does, um, provide some background for us for the, how they provide such a great benefit to the village of Gurney, and tell us where you're at this year. It's not as informal, right? It is. <laughs> it might yes. sound formal, but yeah, it is it's informal. <laughs> so, good evening, everyone. I know a lot of you were at the uh, annual meeting, so some of this you might have heard before, but it's always good to have it reinforced, right? We're uh, always happy to come and talk to you all, and um, I don't even know if I need this microphone. Do I need it? Oh, okay. <laughs> happy to talk to you all about your, your partnership um, with uh, Visit Lake County, and I'll be talking first, and then we have Hank and John from Six Flags, and Randy, and then uh, Nadine Miracle, who's the new general manager at, at Great Wolf Lodge, and I'm also delighted that Roger Roger Blackmere is with us. Where's Roger? There he is. From the uh, Holiday, uh, Holiday and Gurney came to support us this evening as well. So thanks for coming, Roger. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview on the partnership, talk about some of the marketing strategies and websites, social media, some things like that, and the group sales and the economic impact. So let me start with, I think you all know the mission of our organization is to, is to really promote great uh, Lake, Lake County and also Gurney as a premier destination. And we do that through a variety of marketing strategies. But it's really about the economic vitality of what we do and the importance of that uh, to the village of Gurney. And we know how much um, you're interested in tourism and it's such a big part of uh, your strategies and uh, economic development here in the village. We have a staff of eight and we're located right here in Gurney and uh, John McGuire is with me this evening. He's our, our um, our business development manager and um, John handles some of our uh, special promotions that I'll be speaking of in a minute too. Our funding, we're very fortunate to receive a state grant. As one of the largest service areas in the state, we are able to tap into a, um, a state tourism grant, and it has to be matched through all of our, our communities, local sources from uh, community partnerships, advertising, and then our industry partners as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. But, um, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that we just got our recertification again as, a, um, as part of our international association. We're recognized for our commitment for industry excellence and uh, high standards for performance. So I think you can be reassured that we're at the top of our game, game and uh, one of um, a couple hundred CVBs throughout the uh, country that are certified. And then you'll see a list of the community partners. We've added a couple partners in the last couple of years. So we really have a large footprint all over the county. And we're serving a number of communities. I mentioned those who will be speaking this evening. Um, they're also on our board of directors. We've got, um, you know, of course, Joe Ross is our board chairman and has been for, gosh, I think it's probably seven or eight years now. And uh, Randy Butowski is our secretary, John Kraniak is our treasurer, and then Nadine Miracle is a, a new director on our board. So we're delighted to have that kind of representative here in, from Gurney. 
So marketing strategies, it's really about building this strong, authentic brand for Lake County. We do it through uh, the website, visitor's guide, integrated campaigns, and then special promotions that we've introduced in the last couple of years in our uh, group business recruitment as well. So we introduced a new website, oh gosh, I think it was in uh, June, and really went to more visual images, a lot more uh, uh, just um, engaging photographs. We really want to inspire people to think about trip planning or travel to this area. And the most popular section of the website continues to be the calendar of events. A lot of people have it bookmarked now, go in weekly or so and look at all the events. We're really a great resource for all the festivals and events happening throughout the county. And then people love the guides to the top events. So I went back and looked at how many events we had in Gurnee in the past 12 months and it was 115. It's a lot of events happening here in Gurnee. So we're promoting all of those through the website and this gives you an idea of, um, of what it now looks like, so you have to go in and check it out, but a lot of big hero images, and um, again, trying to make it as engaging as possible to really get people to think about how much there is to do in the area. And this was a, um, we um, have a blog on top things to do in Lake County, and of course, Six Flags would be one of those. We do a lot of seasonal campaigns. Summer is the biggest time period. And we use a, a number of different touch points from social media and billboards, metro rail cards, newspaper inserts, Pandora, Spotify, connected TV. You know, just a lot of things to get people to go into these dedicated landing pages. And Six Flags has been an ongoing co-op partner in our summer campaign. Um, and they're really the centerpiece of that campaign. The messaging is about Lake County, but also really emphasizing Six Flags. And of course, it was great this year with the introduction of Mac Max Force. And so uh, the target audience for this particular campaign is really Chicago and the suburban area. It's a major metropolitan area that we want to speak to and get them to think about coming up to Lake County for a weekend getaway, a couple of days in the summer. So this was um, seen by about 40 million times by our audience. We also do a media buy with Six Flags in the outer market, so that's beyond the Chicago area and some of the other markets they're advertising in it to try and drive some overnight stays into the Gurney area. These are a couple of samples of some of the outdoor billboards. Really liked them. They really st stood out because they're digital this year. So it just kind of gives you an idea what the branding was this year. The digital campaign had a uh, sweepstakes component to it with an uh, overnight uh, stay and um, tickets to Six Flags. And um, I think one of the things that was pretty impressive on it was the number of in impressions on the YouTube video that we were running. I'm going to show you that in a minute. It was over a million impressions. On our particular channel, we had 56,000 views of, of this particular 15-second video as well. The campaign did really well. One of the things that I always find interesting is how many people actually sign up for the sweepstakes. It's still amazing to me that we had almost 16,000 people actually signed up for the sweepstakes. So that allows us to take all of those email addresses and then begin to correspond with them and communicate with them on a regular basis and then talk to them about the fall campaign, the holiday campaign and other times a year as well. So that's always exciting for us. So Jack, we're going to see if this video is going to work. It's only 15 Hello. seconds. Hello. Have you looked in your backyard lately? There's a world-class amusement park. Six Flags with seven short and sweet, right? <laughs> That's what people love. If they're, We are running these ads on Facebook and Instagram, and if you're on those social platforms, you know how it is. You, sh you see these, and you, you know, it just makes you think, oh my gosh, yes, I need to go to Six Flags this summer. So it's, it's really good for reinforcing the message that then was available through all these other um, media components as well. So that was, that was quite popular this summer. And then, talk about fall. We're still in the middle of our fall campaign, obviously anchored by Fright Fest. Again, a cross-channel mix with newspaper inserts, connected TV now, very popular for ads. We have a dedicated landing site that lists all of the fall activities uh, throughout the county. Again, um, you know, the Fright 
Fest being the anchor to all of this. But again, we had some really cool advertising going on with, I love this, you know, we're following you, you know, that you might see that on your Instagram account or your Facebook and, and uh, just some really cool branding. It's called Spooks and Spirits. So the spirit side has kind of this double meaning because we're also promoting our libation trail. And then we're doing this check-in challenge for the month of October to tr encourage people to sign up to be part of our, our libation trail. And then the encouragement is um, they, they could win tickets to the um, Gurney Craft Beer Fest and Six Flags and then an overnight stay at a, a hotel in Gurney as well. So if they sign up for the check-in challenge, they'll be entered and, and then they have to go to five libation trail partners throughout the month of October. Then they'll be registered to win these tickets. So it gives us a chance to promote the craft craft beer festival as well through our advertising. Again, this is primarily done through Instagram and Facebook ads and then YouTube videos as well. So that's going on right now this month. Soon to be over and then we'll be giving those those tickets out and then they get an overnight stay. So it's a really nice way to cross promote the libation trail as well as um, your uh, the craft beer festival coming up. Then we've got the digital campaign right on the heels of fall with uh, uh, also Facebook and Instagram ads and the sweepstakes. The sweepstakes work really well again to collect names. So last year Gurney and Antioch were both uh, partners in this campaign and both communities are in it again this year. So that's great. We love um, being able to promote both communities and working with Ellen Dean again on this campaign and promoting shopping in Gurnee. We're promoting obviously Holiday in the Park. We're promoting the Great Wolf Lodge and just all the things and all the activities and of course the um, the gurney, the train, you know, that's one of the most popular things is the holiday train. Um, so a lot of things going on in Gurney that we can promote during the holiday time period. So you've got a little bit information on last year. Gurney Mills is also part of the campaign and um, have um, donated gift cards the last couple of years and that obviously is a great incentive for the uh, sweepstakes as well. So just a couple more examples of uh, digital marketing here. Again, we went back and looked at how many mentions we had of Gurney businesses last year on social media. So there were 336, and yes, believe me, we track all of this information um, just on an ongoing basis for our community partnerships. We know it's important to you to be able to see what we're doing for Gurney specifically. So here's some of the uh, popular posts from the farmer's market to um, staff uh, riding uh, Max Force the first day. I'm glad I'm not in that photo. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, from uh, Great Wolf Lodge as well. Some other posts here from uh, Bass Pro, obviously the Holiday Train, uh, Only Child Brewing, uh, Gurney Mills there. Just a number of different posts throughout the years. We also have a, a staff writer who is constantly writing blogs. They're very popular. And uh, Gurney businesses were mentioned in 141 blogs last year. So again, you've got some ex examples from everything from even there was a, a post there about the um, Gurney Park District, uh, Chocolate Sanctuary, Mother Rudd House as well. So a lot going on to promote. So Lake County Restaurant Week. Uh, we've now completed four years of this. It's been growing every year. We had 66 restaurants last year, so we're hoping that we can expand it even beyond that. We had seven restaurants in Gurney participate last year. And one of the exciting things we introduced was these Facebook Live and worked with um, WXLC uh, personalities, but also Mike Kaplan. And you know, Mike Kaplan has such a huge following. So he actually did a, a Facebook Live at Saludos that over 17,000 people were watching live while he's eating at Saludos talking about Restaurant Week. So it was, a, again, a really great way to cross promote. And I know Saludos was really happy with it. So we'll be working on Restaurant Week again coming up in March. Um, Oh, next year, let's see. It's February 28th to March 8th is uh, next year for um, Lake County Restaurant Week. So we'd love to get even more Gurney restaurants to participate. We uh, particularly like independent restaurants, um, family restaurants, little kind of out of the way restaurants are really great candidates for this. They just have to offer some kind of something special, discount special menus are great. So uh, John McGuire uh, handles uh, Restaurant Week for us and Lake County Libation Trail as well. 
an only child, is a participant in Lake County Libation Trail. And it's been going really well. We keep finding more and more craft breweries in Lake County. It's just amazing. But the more, the better. I think it just gives us a chance to even have more to promote during the libation trails. I mentioned we're doing the check-in challenge this month. And then we're going to keep this mobile platform up and be able to track how many people are checking in at these various uh, craft breweries, wineries, and distilleries in, in Lake County. So we now have this tracking mechanism in place, which I think will be really helpful. Um, it also makes it seem like even more of a trail. Um, we're doing, so it said we've got the Spooks and Spirits um, going during the fall campaign, and then we'll do something special probably in January and have a whole libation month like we did last year. It's kind of a slower time of year, and, and we can help spread the word on these, um, you know, these great locations throughout Lake County. Let me mention the, the group business side. This is, uh, I've got this uh, sales team in place that actively recruits meetings and conferences and tournaments. Um, obviously, sports tourism is important to Gurney, um, and we know that people might be playing at a tournament, a soccer tournament that might be in Libertyville or Waukegan, but they may be staying at Gurney hotels. So we find that the sports business is really, you know, it, it, it just intersects a lot of different communities because there's so much housing involved and there's there's so many opportunities and there's so many families coming in and Gurney is obviously the ideal market for, for the sports business. Last year in Gurney, we had 46 groups that came as part of what we call the group business side, which was almost a million, just an economic impact here in Gurney from, from group business, about 2,500 rooms. A lot of it was the, the sports rooms, everything from the, like the lacrosse tournaments, which was in Vernon Hills, to soccer and basketball. There were some corporate meetings, tour groups, some weddings that were held here as well. And we also issued 104 referrals for future business that uh, could be booked here in Gurney. One of, the more, uh, one of the really exciting things that's happening is the Democratic National Convention, as you know, is coming to Milwaukee next July, but will have a huge impact in Lake County and particularly in Gurney. So some of the state delegations will be staying here in Gurney and will be bused up to Milwaukee every day. So there's going to be an, an economic impact from the housing here, as well as when they get back late at night. Um, we're learning a lot about um, what they like to do when they get back to the hotels. They, they still want to stay up and have a good time and talk with all their friends. And, but they, the impact will be tremendous on this whole area. But um, um, Gurney certainly will, will feel the impact of having the DNC in Milwaukee. I wanted to just show you a sample of a, um, an ad. This is for a family reunion. And I you know both Great Wolf Lodge and Holiday and Gurney have um, certainly hosted family reunions and are just ideal locations for family reunions. We do some marketing, particularly just to that market, because it, it's, it's such a, we're, we're, the, we're the perfect venue for family reunions with so much to do here. So that's Kim Heiss from our office who handles that market. And um, she's been very active in it through the years. And this particular ad was in uh, Reunions magazine. And then finally, just a little bit on the overall economic impact of tourism. This is really an uh, essential investment. I like to say, effective tourism marketing enhances the public image of a village and helps build a sense of community pride. I think it also, it's not only that we're trying to attract visitors, but it's also an import, important source, a source of community pride and also for local businesses too. The image of Gurney is, is really important and we can help you elevate that image through tourism. And it also puts people to work every day. There's, all, there's over 11,000 people in Lake County employed in the tourism industry. And our economic impact numbers keep uh, growing every year. It's up to $1.4 in visitor spending throughout the county. So that was up 6.7%. We had one of the highest growths in the state last year in terms of the economic impact from uh, visitor spending. The uh, state of Illinois, which d tracks all of this information and handles this research, said the average travel party spends $570 when they travel, so in when they stay and pay accommodations, $570, pretty significant. 
So now I uh, want to turn it over to our, our partners because they're such a powerful part of what we do. We couldn't do this if we didn't have a partnership. So I think it's really important that you hear from our, our um, major partners here in Gurney. But before I turn it over to them, let me thank you again for all you do for us and the investment you make in us, the confidence that you have in us to continue to represent you as a tourism organization. You know, we're the voice for you out there. We're the organization that provides these partnerships and works in collaboration with our key partners here and um, I think we, we just we have a really we have a really great team not only the staff of Visit Lake County but also our board and all of our partners and they're really you know they're really dedicated and they're just terrific to work with so first we're going to start with Six Flags and it's going to be John or Hank Hank John's going first okay so let me turn it over to to John you can take the microphone and I don't know. Do you need a clicker? Oh, it's just a couple slides. That's all right. So uh, thank you, Maureen. Uh, John Craniac, I think most of you, no, I know most of you. Uh, Six Flags Great America, the Director of Marketing. Um, wanted to give a quick update on the park uh, so far. 2019 has been going well. Um, record rainfall we endured in May uh, that lasted way too long into June. Um, and almost on cue, the, the clouds parted, the sun came out about a week before we got Max Force open for the year. Led into the holiday, uh, July 4th, and, and a really strong July and August for us. So um, it, was, it was good timing, uh, looking back on it all. Um, uh, took us to Fright Fest. It's our longest Fright Fest that we've ever had. Eight weekends of Fright Fest will wrap up this coming weekend. Kind of a bonus for us uh, this year. We did not have this coming weekend as Fright Fest last year, so we anticipate a little pickup there. Um, we've had some kind of poorly timed weather, but uh, what is nice about Fright Fest is it just continues to be a very popular event. Um, we, for this weekend, as a perfect example, we had rain on Saturday, uh, stronger than was forecasted and it was up against I think our maybe our biggest single biggest day of 2018 last year so awful timing to have some rainfall but we bounced back immediately on Sunday with a really strong day picked up you know thousands of visits to prior year um, so it just speaks to the strength of it people's intent to visit for Fright Fest they're not deterred they didn't come on Saturday well darn it they're coming on Sunday then so bounce back right away and look forward to a, a good strong weekend to wrap up the event this year um, then we have a little break between our two holiday events that uh, we were able to partner with everyone here on the Legions of Beer Fest uh, to come to the park this year. After several years at Gurney Mills in the parking lot, um, we took a shot to host Last Call the last couple of years, and I think both of us were kind of at a bit of a crossroads with the events that we were hosting and said, you know, let's see if we can bring this together. And it were similar efforts, similar nature for the events, so we're really looking forward to it. Um, you know, our, our, our friends, our corporate partners down in Texas, they, they don't like too many weekends when we're not operating. So um, we look for an opportunity to kind of fill this gap between Fright Fest and Holiday in the park. Um, we're supplementing it with uh, free attendance to active and retired military personnel. Uh, thought it was a perfect tie-in to the event, um, to Veterans Day weekend, and you know, it's the first time in my knowledge, definitely in my time, I think in the history of the park that we've offered free uh, attendance to the park to military personnel so uh, really nice opportunity we're looking forward to that weekend as well and then we're gonna have one weekend off to hang about two and a half million lights for a holiday in the park so uh, they've been doing that since July so you look real closely around the park you see strings of lights kind of everywhere um, but it was an absolutely magnificent event last year um, really strong reviews to everybody that was able to attend or from them um, so we're looking forward to year two of the event uh, the calendar allowed us to kind of expand it by one weekend, um, but it is, um, you know, being able to extend our operating calendar into these shoulder months to convince people to come out and ride roller coasters in November and December uh, is not a very natural or easy thing to do, so we know it takes a special effort and to really uh, make the park an immersive experience, and it, it's what we were able to do. Our, I can't say enough about the efforts of our, our entertainment and our maintenance and our operating groups to get the park ready for this. It's, if you haven't seen it, I just encourage you to come on out and, and see Holiday in the Park. It is just uh, an, an 
incredible transformation to you know what we do for Fright Fest, how different the park looks every at every turn from it is during the regular season during the summer, and then move that forward to the holiday in the park. It is it is just an incredible transformation and just it, unmatched anywhere on on the look and feel of the event at Six Flags. Um, and then looking forward to 2020, uh, Tsunami Surge is what's classified as a water coaster. So, and this particular water coaster is going to be the world's tallest water coaster. Uh, 950 feet long, eight stories, uh, the 25th attraction out in Hurricane Harbor, top speed of over 28 miles per hour, which is a lot slower than really any roller coaster we have, but uh, rather daunting when you're thinking you're in an inflatable raft going 28 miles an hour. So um, there's some uphill blasts of this, and it is uh, a unique element that we have that is, it doesn't exist anywhere really close around here. It's a rather new technology, this aqualucent effects that it's going to look like there's lighting throughout different parts of the ride as you're going through the dark portions of the slide. And it's just a, an incredible video to watch if you get a chance to pull that up or not and save it up for our tsunami surge because it's going to be a, a great experience. Um, so we're really looking forward to this new attraction. Um, our, our corporate group I mentioned down in Dallas continues to invest in the property. Uh, we're one of the big boys in the system, so we enjoy that, uh, you know, that they continue to recognize the need for additional capital investment pretty much every year without exception uh, here at our park. So. Um, looking forward to another year in 2020. Um, just a shout out real quick to Maureen and the team at Visit Lake County. Um, just a, an outstanding group of tourism professionals all around. Um, very passionate, very dedicated. Um, it is, they, they keep up with everything in the industry. They keep up with their marketing efforts, the media platforms. I'm always impressed that between Visit Lake County and their ad agency, how closely their strategies mirror our own with what we're doing to try and reach uh, moms, the decision makers in the family, as well as the teen audiences. Um, so it is never any hesitation to part with, partner with them on all of our marketing efforts because they align so closely. Um, and uh, you know, the strong leadership all around over there. Um, so we sincerely appreciate the partnership with Visit Lake County, and we definitely appreciate the support that the village lends to their efforts because it goes a long way for us. They leverage Six Flags, their focus is on Lake County, but they recognize as uh, we are a key driver in the entire area. So uh, anything they're promoting, international travel and reunions and um, sports tournaments and all that, they're leveraging Six Flags in all their communication because they know we're a key driver for anything that they're bringing to the area. So again, our appreciation from both the village and Visit Lake County on the continued partnerships. So thank you so much. Hank, or am I handing it over to Randy? And I, so. Thanks, John. Right. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yep. Good evening. Um, I'm Randy Bertowski, General Manager of Gurney Mills. I think I know you all. You all know me. So just a quick... Um, Quick highlight on Gurney Mills and the shopping center industry. I thought this was a great quote. It's from Tom McGee, the president of ICSC. And uh, the best shopping centers are built around the needs of a community. Shopping centers power ec economies, build communities, and inspire innovation. And uh, I, I think that, that really speaks to Gurney Mills especially. We're in the midst of a retail renaissance. I think retail is transitioning from what it was in the past to what it's becoming, a consumer channel. That's really only one, there's really only one channel and that's what the consumer wants. Again, so I always say shopping centers are fashion and fashion always is always changing and that's what's happening in the shopping center industry and it's exciting. There's a lot of talk of course about a retail apocalypse happening. Um, if you just look at these stats and numbers, you'll see it's, it's, it's not true. There's actually, I think, as Tom said, a renaissance happening, something new, something uh, ever-changing. Um, and the number of stores change, chains closing is actually, um, has decreased. New stores opening is up from 18 to 19, up to 64% uh, in 19. Um, here are some of the stores that have opened this year at Gurney Mills. So, and we still have more to come. This year, um, we're, we're excited that Alpha Media is under construction. Uh, they've got their drywall up and they started doing some interior painting today. 
and, uh, and some other exciting things happening. We'll be nearly fully occupied, all of our inline stores, for the holidays, uh, yet again. So excited about that. Um, shopping centers build community. This is what's happening with younger consumers, what, what they want. So right now, in 1985, a few years ago, 64% uh, of people's discretionary income uh, expenditures went toward products, buying a product. Whereas the future of the forecast in 2030, only 52% are saying that they're going to be buying products with their discretionary income. So what does that mean? More experiential things, more experiences, more experiential products. And that's what you'll see more of in shopping centers and more of in Gurney Mills. That's where our focus is. So some of the things that we do, some of the experiences that we have. Of course, the, um, the Fire Expo that we partner with uh, the Lake County Fire Chiefs Association, our Winter Craft Fair that we, that, um, that we, we have in uh, February timeframe, Boobash, which we just had last Thursday, about 4,000 people came out to the mall and trick-or-treated. It's always a, a huge success. And of course, Santa's coming in a couple of weeks, if you're ready or not, here he comes. Uh, and one thing that's not in here is the Lake County uh, Police Expo that we put on this year, which we're really proud of that we're able to bring that to Gurney Mills and we're hoping that's gonna continue on for years and years to come. It was a, a, a huge success for both, I think, the, the police in throughout Lake County as well as our customers, our community, who got to go out and see and shake hands with the police officer. So some of the things we do, of course, we generate about 3,000 jobs for the, for the county. Um, we, uh, one of the things we did is we held a job fair um, at Gurney Mills and tried to partner up our retailers with, with people looking for employment. So speaking of experiential, here's a few of the stores that we have right now. And, um, and as I said, there's more to come, like, for example, Alpha Media. So um, I know you guys are well versed on what this is bringing not only to Gurney Mills but to the community. But um, they're slated to open probably January, February time frame. Uh, the offices will probably get open a little bit sooner, and then the radio stations will follow probably around February or so. And the reason being is they've got to run a lot of wiring and and cables and everything. So they put the antenna up on the roof for, uh, for this, the, the individual stations. So the offices will be in place and open, we're expecting sooner, maybe even the end of December, that's my hope. So um, in addition, Alpha Media is going to be bringing 30 different events plus per year to the show court. We're in conversations with them for what the, the media is gonna be like, because we'll be advertising on the radio station, we'll be doing, um, kind of man on the street uh, interviews. We'll be having talks about the latest and greatest fashion or the newest things that are happening at Gurney Mills. Um, and uh, we're, we are thrilled to be bringing that to Gurney Mills. And of course, it's gonna be anchoring the north end of the shopping center near Florin Decor. So what does uh, Visit Lake County, obviously there's a huge tie-in to experiential and to shopping centers transitioning more to that experience. Visit Lake County is about tourism and travel and bringing new people to the area, whether it be to Great Wolf Lodge, Six Flags, or Gurney Mills. So it falls right in line with what our goals and objectives are. So not only right now and for years and years have they been bringing customers to Gurney Mills, but also in the future with the new things that we have coming out. So. Um, Maureen and her team of eight do a phenomenal job. We're very proud to have them as a partner for Gurney Mills. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Good. Thank you. Oh, I think I'm good. Oh, thank you. So, good evening. My name is Nadine. I'm the general manager here. Oh, 
at uh, Great Wolf Lodge here in Illinois. And so today I do not have any slides, but I'm here to introduce myself as uh, relatively new to the community. Myself, I'm very excited to be here uh, with my family. I'm the mom of two wonderful young boys, Cooper and Clay, two and four year olds. And I actually started my journey with Great Wolf 12 years ago in 2007 in our Pennsylvania Lodge. And I've had the opportunity to work at three of our other destinations. And we at Great Wolf Lodge have always found a really wonderful purpose in bringing joy to families. And we not only want to bring joy to families, but we also feel that it's very important to enrich the lives of the PAC members who work with us, as well as the lives of those in the communities around us. So being here in Lake County, uh, in Lake County and specifically the village of Gurney is really important. Um, wanted to take a minute to tell you a little bit more about our year in 2019. Off to a really great start as far as we've fully come one calendar year after opening in June 2018 as the Great Wolf Lodge of Illinois, closest to our corporate headquarters in Chicago. So a really great property and destination and something really new for our brand. Um, for those of you who may have visited the Wisconsin Dells, our property is very much a stark contrast uh, to what Great Wolf has been. And we're actually one of the newer generation three properties as we call it. For us, this year has been really great in that we've actually been able to exceed our, um, our objectives in occupancy. And so we've exceeded our target of being at 70% occupancy for the year. However, that did come at a little bit of a sacrifice to our room rate, um, which was a little disappointing. But what we overall learned is that what we as Great Wolf Lodge in our new destination here is actually awareness. Um, there is still a lack of awareness that Great Wolf Lodge is in the village of Gurney and a lot of our uh, major demographics actually still associate Great Wolf Lodge with the Wisconsin Dells. So being part of uh, the village of Gurney and specifically uh, part of the Visit Lake County Bureau, um, it's going to be really important as we continue to make the village of Lake County a destination that Great Wolf is also part of that. So we really look forward to building this partnership. Want to say a huge thank you to Maureen because I was very new to the community, only been here less than a month now. Um, and Maureen had the opportunity to reach out to me, connect with me, and really help gave me a great understanding of the area and took a lot of time. And I really do appreciate that. We as Great Wolf Lodge, uh, we really look forward to being more involved with Visit Lake County and especially the marketing efforts that are coming forward in 2020 so that we can build more awareness that we are here as a destination. In 20, in, as we come to a close in 2019 and into 2020, something that our company has come to understand that is really important to our guests mm -hmm. and bringing in, um, bringing in our families is our seasonal campaigns. And so this year, for the first time ever in 2019, we launched what we called our Great Wolf Lodge, or a Great Wolf Lodge Summer Campin. So not sure if any of you had the opportunity to visit the lodge this summer or see any of our ads, but it was really great. It gave our guests who otherwise a lot of times in the summer have a lot of different opportunities to go to outdoor venues. It gave them a really great reason to come to Great Wolf Lodge in the summer, and our numbers exceeded expectations. We are currently in our fall festival, which we call our Halloween campaign, uh, which is a lot of fun. And if you come into our grand lobby, you're going to see our massive uh, wolf spider uh, overhanging the lobby that's composed of over 6,000 balloons. And as we go into the latter part of the season, we're going to start our Snowland Festival. So we're extremely excited building onto that programming. And as we go into 2020, our Spring of Palooza, Summer Camp in Halloween and Snowland are gonna become an even more important part of what we do. And so we're really excited that with these marketing efforts that we're going to put together, that we can continue to partner with Visit Lake County and make this a destination that where uh, what's, good for the what's good for Lake County is good for the village of Gurney. So, that is it for me. Any questions? Yeah. Thanks, Nadine. I think we'll right. probably have questions for everybody. So just All welcome right. to Gurney. So Thank thanks. you. Happy to be here. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank just you. Just actually before we, Maureen, did you have something else? I was just going to have give mm -hmm. Trustee Ross an opportunity since okay. she's chairman of all this, right? Do you have any comments you'd like to make? Or? 
Just that it's a wonderful group to work with and, and the board um, uh, is very encouraging. We have lots of good questions back and forth and um, uh, it's a big benefit for Gurney. <laughs> So Maureen, is it okay if uh, you and your band can take some comments and questions from us? Is that okay? Of course. Maybe I'll start to sure. my right. Is there uh, Trustee Thorsonson? I always have a question. So kind of putting it together. So thanks, everybody. That's awesome. And I uh, look forward to meeting you and working with you also there. Um, what, Randy, when you talk about the experiential learning or experiential, you didn't call it learning, but I, that's another term in the business, but that type of um, activity, mm -hmm. How does that work for all of the businesses here? And what are we missing in Gurney? So I know Ellen probably knows this. You didn't, I probably could have asked her because I'm sure you've told her. What business are we missing to help each other get more customers? And Boy, I don't want to stump you, but you know, like we were doing the, <clears throat> that's we were doing a big the question. SFA for a while, you know, the sports sure. triangle property. And yep. I don't think that worked, or maybe it did. I haven't heard lately, but. I'm just meaning, what are we missing that would help? I know uh, when Six Flags enrollment is up, the hotels generally are, correct? And so hearing, John, that you had two really great months, I'm hoping that they carried over to the hotels. And so then thinking, of, though, of Great Wolf, well, though, Armor, Gurney Mills. So basically, what are we, are we, we missing we a see, bowling alley? Are we missing, you know, something like that? The, we, um, one of, the, one of the benefits to me being on the, the Visit Lake County Board is I'm able to see those hotel numbers every month and I can immediately correlate that to how our sales and traffic is doing. Uh, as Maureen mentioned, they have a lot of um, sports groups, high school sports groups that come to the area and stay here in our hotels, stay, stay at Great Wolf Lodge, go to Six Flags. We always see those kids in their uniforms walking through the shopping center. So those types of things uh, definitely benefit us. Whenever you have, whether it be something new, a new roller coaster, a new ride opening at Six Flags, we always see a bump in numbers. Uh, Great Wolf Lodge, since they uh, rebranded and reopening, we've seen increased numbers. Um, since the, we finished the mall renovation in November of last year, so almost a year now, and then finish the Dining Pavilion North renovation in the spring. We've seen an increased number. So our comp sales and our traffic at the mall has been up this year, which I'm really thrilled to say. Um, but what more do we need? Those, I, I, those, are, those are things, a lot of that is we're working on behind the scenes and the village has been a tremendous partner to us, whether it be supporting the, uh, the businesses, new businesses that wanna come to Gurney Mills or proposing working with Ellen and her team on brainstorming and coming up with ideas and tenants that we want to target and go after. We've done some of that too. And um, so we're always looking for that latest and greatest. And whether it be a bowling alley or a recplex center, um, those are big picture ideas that I fully support. I love it. We've got to find that developer, investor, owner, operator, that is ready to come to the table and work with us. So identifying that person, sometimes that's, that's the next step. So does that answer some of your questions? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I know Ellen represents us and goes to all these associations, so I'm sure if it's on top of your wish list that it's already in her ear or her head. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. I have maybe one small thing, sorry. <laughs> Last thing I need is a microphone, but Jack will yell at me if I don't use it. So. Um, I, I think one thing I might add, I think one of the things <laughs> that always is a little bit of a difficulty to us that some of our sister parks have is a better public transportation op option for us. I know we're not going to build a train station, I got it, but you know, having opportunity, and we've even talked to the mayor about it in the past, and Pat, you know, of opportunity for a better way to get from Libertyville or Waukegan or, or you know, Vernon Hills or, or Prairie Crossing train stations for an opportunity to get more business out of the city, I think would be a huge benefit to all of us. I mean, some people, and there's millions of people, just look today, there's 9 million people in the Chicago DMA, the, the, uh, the you know, the area of 
influence in Chicago. If you don't have a car, and a, and a lot of people who live in the city, south side of the city, don't have that opportunity uh, to easily get here. And pace runs, I, I know that, but the timing of taking a train to a train station and waiting on the timing of a pace bus to get to one of our facilities becomes incredibly challenging and difficult. And if an opportunity were to come away to shuttle people from the train station to, to our properties, I think it would be a huge benefit to getting people and people who, what we would call an incremental visit. It's not people who live in Gray's Lake coming into the market. It's people who are living so far away that they're gonna potentially stay overnight. They're gonna eat at the restaurants. They're gonna buy gas, or they're not gonna buy gas if it's public transportation, but they're gonna spend money in Gurney and at all of our facilities as well. So I, I, Karen, that's the one that really pops into my mind. It's a great question though. Thanks, Hank. Somebody else to my right that has questions or comments? Trustee O'Brien. Thank you. Thank you for the fantastic presentations. Um, comment, love that Great America is offering uh, free admission to the active and retired military over Veterans Day. That's fantastic. It would be really interesting if it coincided with graduation over at Great Lakes because then maybe the Great Lakes people might come to Gurney. I know they're often at the mall, but it would be interesting if they were at the mall, if they spent the night, if they went to Great, all of you here could tie it all in. That's wonderful. And since this is only the first year, I bet after, and uh, Mayor, I believe, knows the commander over at Great Lakes. It would be a nice thing to be able to promote <coughs> over to them. Even though this is the inaugural year, it might draw some more people into our town just knowing that it's there because I, I haven't seen much of it on social media. Uh, anyone speculate, are we already pre-selling for the DNC? Are we pre-selling? Like our hotel rooms fixing, uh, filling up? Yeah, a lot of the hotel blocks are already sold and spoken for, so the housing contracting company has been out here a number of times and was working with our hotels and negotiating contracts. So the major hotels in Gurney already have their, their blocks and their set and signed contracts. And then there'll be some fill-in beyond that as well as other people start coming in. So we've got the state delegations here and other, other blocks staying here, but there'll be even more activity in the area. They will be up in Milwaukee for the majority of the day and then they come back later in the evening. So they'll be here morning, early afternoon go up to Milwaukee and then come back later. So it'll be interesting to see, we're trying to get an, a handle on how many f families will come to because it is in July and you know Six Flags has information from other parks that have been part of the DNC and Nadine was part of the DNC and um, Charlotte as well. So she's actually got <coughs> some really good background information on um, how this all works. But, um, they're here for at least uh, probably five or six days a lot of them will stay uh, during that, that week time period. Some might come in on the weekends, either weekend too. So there'll be a lot of activity in Gurney. Thank you. Anybody this way? Trustee Garner. Um, just a comment. First of all, thanks for the presentation. Secondly, um, I say this every year, thanks for the uh, making planning for family reunions so easy. Um, so if you've got to do a family reunion, I do mine every other year practically, and, and I've, um, I guess I'm up to half a dozen by now, and it just makes it so easy. Just visit the Lake County website, and you're there. They take care of the rest. They make it so easy. So if you plan a family reunion, visit the Lake County website. But uh, also I have a question on, um, uh, it's more of a technical question. Maureen, maybe you can answer this. Um, the different, just for clarity, the difference between a click and a digital impression and what information you're gaining from that? Um, cause yeah, this that's a good question, yeah. Yeah, so a, a digital impression is, um, so it's, it's being viewed through your, like your site, like, um, you know, if you're on Facebook or something, it's being viewed through that. It could be like an impression. And then if you actually click through to it, then we can track that and then you might be clicking through to a landing page or something else. So you're clicking you know, deeper through into it. Impression is 
It's a little bit, I mean, you could think of it like almost like a circulation of a, a newspaper or something like that. It's how many eyeballs can see that ad. And then once you click through, we can, we can track it too. That's kind of the beauty of digital advertising is that you can really track who's seeing it and then who's clicking through. I don't know, maybe John, you want to add something to impressions? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, that's right. The definitions are certainly there. Um, I've seen some kind of wildly exaggerated statistics about uh, digital impressions at times. It seems when people post these lofty billions of impressions and things, it's like, uh, I don't know that you can value that as the same impression that you'd have from, uh, you know, a, a broad-based media like a TV or radio, but um, it feels better when you can say that you had 12 billion impressions on something. So, um, but that, that's essentially defined correctly. The click is when you get more active engagement with them, and that's when you see the statistics get a little bit more real. In my mind, by my estimates, when you're seeing six-tenths of a percent of people that actually clicked, that engaged with that, and that can be a positive thing. You know, that there's a lot of ads out there that don't get any of that. The speed with which most people are, are going through screens on phones and on laptops and on different devices and all that is remarkable that, you know, how quick your video needs to be, how quick that impression needs to be before you grab that. It's, uh, it's, it's something else and keeping up with it is, is a task. Uh, us trying to reach teens is a really tall order now. They, they, they keep, they're very elusive. They keep, as soon as you think you caught them, they're on to the next platform and you got to get there. So. Um, we we'll yeah, beat it to death. You can tell I'm trying to keep up, right? Yeah, right, right. That's all. Yeah, great. Thanks. Jesse Bomas? Um, Randy, I get asked this all the time. So where, where are we at with the Sears? Do you, are you got anything on the hook? I don't want to necessarily if, know that you can't always reveal everything, but. I can say we're in conversations with other entities um, to lease that space. I, I can't, until we have an executed lease, I can't go beyond that. No, I realize that. So, I just, still I, in, in it's conversations. It's nice to hear, though, that there's things in the Absolutely. works. Absolutely. We, we have uh, demand at Gurney Mills. Like I said, we're going to be, uh, our inline spaces will be pretty close to 100% full for the holiday season. So, and uh, those couple of anchor stores that we have opportunities, they're the things that are being kicked around and talked about and the people they're talking about are, are exciting and um, so I, I can't talk beyond that. Well, that, Thank you, that's though. encouraging and... Absolutely, no, I, there's good traffic on it. Okay. And then, Hank, you've probably already been dealing with it, but since that issue with the Max Force, and I get it, but I also hear it. So if I'm this far away, I can't imagine the neighborhood that's closest to, are we close to having a right? Yeah, so, so here's where we are, at what uh, Jeannie's talking about. Our new ride, Max Force, is uh, a bit noisy. Um, and I think it, 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 what it is is an air compression. And the, the launch of this goes very fast coaster and as it comes out of the tunnel that it's in, there's air compression that makes uh, a boom, if you will. It's probably the best word for it. I, will, I won't do my imitation. Uh, but it's a boom. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't violate any noise, noise ordinances. Pat's been over, the mayor's been over, we've all taken a, a look. But um, the, the unfortunate thing about uh, sound is the conditions vary, can make that sound travel further. And some days I think it runs, you don't hear it. And other days it sounds like it's in your backyard and your you know, swing set's blowing up. So, and a lot of residents either through social media or directly uh, to Pat and the, and the, the village staff have complained. Um, and as always, we strive to be good neighbors. Um, and that's all we can, can always try to do. Uh, the village has been very supportive of us. We try to be very supportive of the village. So um, <laughs> I, I still laugh at his name. Uh, there's a sound engineer named Tom Thunder, no exaggeration, <laughs> it's his last name, uh, has come over that the village actually recommended to us. You guys have worked with them on other things, I think, on some sound issues uh, in the village. And, and he came over a couple weeks ago, it's been probably about a month ago or so now, 
took a look. He agreed. It's not violating anything, but thought we could bring a contractor in that could potentially uh, put a barrier up of some kind that could mitigate some of the noise. So we're looking at, we're in th at that stage right now. We've gotten a quote back, working with them, trying to figure out how to go about getting it done. It's not cheap. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to get it done. My biggest fear is we do it and it doesn't help. So we want to make sure it's the right thing and making sure we're doing the right stuff. Here's the news. We're only running it two more weekends. It does, it's too cold to run during holiday in the park and nothing's going to get built in two weeks. So we're going to kind of get through the next couple of weeks. We've done a lot of stuff. We're not running it late at night. We're trying to, to, to do the very best we can in the circumstances that we have and putting up a multi-million dollar ride. Uh, that our guests love. It's just a matter of finding a way to be as quiet as we can with the ride. So that's where we are right now. We've gotten the, uh, one quote back. We're working with the sound engineer. We're working with the contractor, working with our own folks to try to make sure before we, you know, do whatever we do that it's actually going to be progressive and quieten things. It's never going to be silent, but we can make it a lot quieter. That's the goal here. So, thank you. Yeah, yep. I appreciate No problem. Anything else, Jane? No, nope. that's, that's, but I thank you all. That's always a good presentation. Uh, Trustee Ross? I just thought of one more thing. When Maureen was talking about the 200 um, uh, CBBs that have gotten that award, that really is a prestigious thing for Maureen and her staff to have that. And also, when we go to the Governor's Conference on Tourism, Maureen is highly, highly admired by all the people that are there. They go to her for information and, and ideas and um, her staff as well. You, they're very well liked and so I, th I thought you should know that. <laughs> so as you can tell, we have a lot of appreciation for each one of you. It's, uh, don't want to hide that appreciation. We just thank you for the efforts you make in the village. We hope that when we say partner, we really mean it. Um, and we feel it. Um, and I can just say that when I see each one of you, I don't have these bad feelings of, oh, I wish this was different. Uh, I just, I'm thankful that when I see you, it's a good feeling. And I, I just thank you for each of your contributions to the village. And Maureen, just thank you very much for your investment, well worth it for us. Um, and especially for uh, the partners we have in town, it makes sense to invest in you and uh, your group. Because if it wasn't for that, then the rest of it just wouldn't work. So thanks to all of you. Um, we're not going to make you listen to floodplain property buyouts, I don't think. So I know Heather would like to be heard, but uh, if you guys would like to leave, we want to honor your time, or you can stay for that. It's up to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So now we have a report from our village engineer, Heather Gallen, and sorry, Heather, that you weren't, uh, you have fewer visitors or fewer people to watch you, but you okay with that? I'm okay with that. All right. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. So a couple meetings back, there were some questions as to what the village has done so far in procuring floodplain properties and how we've made our way through the list over the last several years. Um, so today I'll go over the causes of flooding, which I'm sure everybody here is very familiar with. The summary of the 2001 mitigation plan, general locations of the properties that are um, priorities, the buyout application process, as well as the number of properties we've removed so far. So causes of flooding obviously come from the severe weather that we have in the area, but it can also come from uh, less well-known like snow melt. So that first big snow melt, if it's raining on top of the snow melt, that could be problematic, as well as just the river rising, which is kind of what we noticed recently um, this past September. It doesn't have to be downpouring on us in order for us to experience river flooding. So the floodplain limits and the floodway limits are what surround the Displains River, and those are mapped out um, from flood insurance rate maps, which kind of is built into the name. The reason those are generated is to determine where people need to buy flood insurance. So it's based on risk, um, and the elevations, the, the base flood elevation at those spots. So the flood insurance rate maps are created by FEMA. They map out the limits. So the 1% chance of flooding, also known as the 100-year flood, has 1% chance of happening every single year. 
if I could repeat that, it has a 1% chance of happening every single year. Um, and then for the 500 year flood has a 0.2% chance of flooding in any given year. So that, like I said, determines where flood insurance is required. Uh, back in 2001, the village uh, worked with stormwater management and created the flood mitigation plan where we reviewed the sources of flooding, we evaluated the economic impacts, preventative measures, uh, cr critical facilities in the flood prone buildings, as well as generated the priority list, which included 44 properties at that time. And I think those are included in your packet. So for the buyout locations and process, the priorities are typically Kilbourne, Emerald, McClure, and Old Grand, which are the areas where you'll notice the water rising first after the uh, river floods. So the process in order to procure those properties can be very long. Uh, we work directly with Lake County Stormwater Management because they have staff dedicated to grant funding exclusively. Um, they're professionals at it. They know which grants you'll probably have the best likelihood of receiving as there's more than one type of grant for procuring properties. Well, I guess what, I, what else I'll elaborate on this. So um, the way it goes, they fill out the applications for us based on our priority list. They um, reapply if it's denied or they uh, attach more information if more is requested. They coordinate the funding appropriations and then they work to get it deed restricted so that it no longer um, can be developed in any form or fashion once we've invested the time and money to make it be an open space. So if we go here. Oh. Okay. There we go. Thanks, Jack. So here we have the list of the floodplain properties. So the red has been uh, removed since 1987 to present day. So you'll notice there's a large majority of the projects that have been procured in that area. Um, from 2001 to 2019, we've gotten 19 pro uh, properties out of the floodplain with three, those are the blue highlighted ones, that are currently um, funded and approved. So those are moving forward. So that leads us to 22 in the last 18 years. So we're averaging more than, or about one a year, whereas prior to 2001, we were averaging one every two years. So I think we're doing a better job at getting those done. Now that doesn't mean there's one that happens every single year. Uh, case in point, 2015, we got two. 2016, I think um, none of them received funding for 16, 17, and 18. But in 19, we got three approved. And then there's two that are very close to being approved and one that's being applied for. Um, someone who volunteered and wanted to get the application process going. So I guess at this point, um, uh, I can summarize that SMC has applied for grants for the village in, oh, since 2001, they've uh, applied in 03, 04, 8, 9, 13, 15, 17, 18, and 19. Um, not every year are we successful, but again, we've gotten a good chunk of those properties out of the floodplain and open space. So I'll take any questions if you guys have them at this point. All right, anybody to my left? <laughs> Other than... Trustee Balmas? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a long, slow process. Mm -hmm. Oh, to my right. Trustee or Simpson? Oh. So I was hoping that um, we could discuss going forward um, to make an effort to update our flood. flood mitigation plan since the last time was 2001. Um, obviously, you have your thoughts and reasons. Mine are maybe a little different, but I'm just still thinking that any development north of us has to be really impacting us to some degree. Maybe it's the velocity. I'm not sure what. I'm not um, experienced to know other than just be curious that there um, <coughs> building up north and it's got to be doing something. Um, second point is just anecdotal. I attended the Lake County um, Assessment Appeal meeting last Tuesday at the library and one of our residents raised his hand and was complaining about the village saying that we do, don't do enough to clean out Desplaines River. And that's the reason. So there may be some misconceptions as to what we've done, because I know we've done a lot of that since 2001. 
and you know the we've had the Corps of Engineers in that have been building the banks and everything. So I think that it was unfortunate in front of the 200 people there that his property probably is impacted, but he was throwing it at us. So mm -hmm. just another thought there. And then thirdly, um, recently I was at a, pres a presentation by uh, James Joseph, who used to be our IEMA. When he, we had our last big flood in 2017, he was down here on the, on the news media w circuit with you guys that were when we were flooded. Uh, and he just is now moved over to FEMA, District 5, so he kind of covers the Midwest states. And he's talking about all the floods everywhere else, but not at the moment uh, around Illinois. And he seemed very interested at, in possibly being somebody that might want to review in our mitigation plan and give feedback to see how, if we're doing everything we could be, okay. just as an idea. I appreciate the feedback, thanks. Thanks. Anybody else? One of the things that, <clears throat> that over the years I've heard is that the forest preserve likes to keep it very natural. So the river stays with fallen trees and that kind of thing. So they're not going to clean that up. Nor previous engineer told me that Cleaning out the river won't make any difference. I don't know if David agrees with that or. <laughs> and Fox not, Foxcom isn't coming. I'll put that my, was in the paper today. I'll give you my two cents worth. Okay. Um, the river, Des Plaines River is very flat. There's not a lot of elevation change to the river. It drops about a foot in elevation every mile. So from the Wisconsin border to where it leaves Lake County is about 22 miles. The vertical elevation is 22 feet. So it doesn't matter how deep we dig the channel, how much we dredge the channel, it's not going to move the water any faster. The water and the gravity on the effect of the water is constant. It's going to move slowly because the channel is slow. Um, if there are trees creating a blockade, it will make a small jump in the channel, and anytime that anything like that would happen, um, there would be a response, and we could get those cleaned out if there's a, a kind of a dam created by debris. But typically, the river and the floodplain is so wide and so flat that we really don't see that happening. In the near 20 years that I've been here, we've not experienced that at all. You do see debris in the river, but it's not wide enough and heavy enough to really cause a change or a bump in the floodplain levels. And then one thing, I know, Patrick, we were, you and I were talking about this, and I think you might already be looking into it, David, but I, there was a lot of discussion on what Wadsworth did with a clearing between Dillies and 41, and I thought the assumption was that it was supposed to help the downstream. And so possibly it has not yet, but they removed the project off their website. At least I can't find it anymore because anytime somebody would say, what the heck is going on over there in Gurney off of Dillies, I'd <clears throat> flip them that saying it's Wadsworth and now I can't find it. Right, and just because it's a wetland mitigation project doesn't mean that it's gonna be a water, um, uh, holding water all the time. You know, wetlands are, um, hydric soils, you know, have a lot of moisture in them. Uh, are the plant species, it doesn't necessarily hold water. A lot of the projects that have happened north of us are that way. They do hold water. It kind of takes the peaks off of the, the flash floods uh, that we've seen come down from Wisconsin and the upper uh, river watershed. Uh, but then it holds that water longer. The water still has to come through Gurney, so the, the river doesn't go up as quickly. Uh, but once it goes up, it stays up for a long time, and the receding water, takes, it takes a long time for that to drain out, and we're a little bit exposed during those times. We saw that uh, with our flood event this year. You know, once the water goes up, it hangs up there for a long time, and we're, you know, on call. We're watching those rain forecasts pretty closely uh, for the next little flash flood that could put us over the top. Overall, a benefit, though, definitely.
David, I've been asked multiple times whether uh, having more retention ponds would help um, with the flooding, you know, places to hold the water so that it doesn't build up where it builds up. Uh, is that not a strategy? That absolutely is a strategy. That's why we've been building them and requiring every development to build them uh, through the county since 1992-93. And even before that, uh, IDOT was the original requirer of uh, building detention. So every little bit of water that you can hold at the development site and let trickle out down towards the river is going to be taking that peak off that um, the flooding river. Um, I know SMC had looked at a study or had done a study several years ago. There was a, I want to say it was like 700 acre feet of stormwater storage was what was needed to be able to drop the flood level in Gurney by half a foot. So figure a, a 70 acre parcel, 10 feet of water deep on it is the volume of water that it would take to save us another you know, half a foot. So every little bit helps. Uh, that's what we require every development to do it. Anytime you intensify the impervious surface or the hard surface on any development site, that's why you build those detentions, to try to mimic the natural uh, pre-development site conditions and the runoff conditions. Now, but anytime you make pavement hard surface, you're not letting the water go into the ground. It is going to run off. Uh, so you're creating more water going to the river it's just getting there at the same rate or a little bit slower than what it would have been prior to. So absolutely, detention basins do help. Um, that's the reason why the flood impacts haven't been as bad as they could have been, but it's still more water uh, coming down through the, the same size channel, flat channel. Are there um, detention basin sites? I mean, do we have any sites that we could use for that? We have, over my tenure here, we've rebuilt several of the sites, several of the detention basins. We've changed the restrictors. Uh, there, for example, there were a couple of them up on Fuller Road, uh, I think for the Westgate subdivision. That the first 10 years I was here, I never saw a lick of water in them, uh, even during our heaviest rain events. So we went up there and changed the restrictors, changed some of the piping uh, running into and out of them so that they actually hold water. So we redesigned those based upon current standards rather than the, the 1980s, early 90s standards that they were originally constructed on. So we're trying to maximize the um, benefit of the property that we've already got. There, we don't have large land areas that we could do it in. And a lot of times the, the most ideal land areas are right next to the river or have wetland restrictions on them or other restrictions. You know, the forest preserve is a perfect example. You know, once the forest preserve gets it, they don't want to build detention in it. They want to leave it as natural occurring open space. So yes, there's some land. Is there large enough pieces of land to make a significant difference? Probably not. Um, most likely the best approach is continue doing the small pockets wherever the development is and wherever we see opportunities to do a little bit larger basin, uh, we'll go ahead and take care of those, take those opportunities and, you know, use them to the best of our ability. Thanks. Trustee O'Brien. Uh, Trustee Garner asked most of the questions. Thank you, oh. sir. No, that's good. Uh, I remember a couple weeks ago, Trustee Balmas mentioned that actually removing the houses doesn't necessarily stop the flooding event. It just stops how much we have to pay to try to protect those houses, that I do recall. Um, but piggybacking off of Trustee Garner, if we were <coughs> able to, to, I'm simplistic, but if we were able to basically dig a hole, uh, like around Viking Park or Emerald and Kilbourne there, it also might have an added benefit of making a nice hole where water could go, but also a sledding hill, which would be... Very I'll true, and every structure we remove is less impervious surface, so the water is allowed to infiltrate into the ground. Uh, when the county raised the profile of Washington Street several years ago, <coughs> um, compensatory storage is you know, basically digging the hole for every shovel full of dirt you put in in one place, you have to take out a shovel full and a half somewhere else. Um, the 
properties on the north side of McClure Avenue between McClure and uh, 132. We excavated those down to create some more volume for water to, to land in the floodplain. Uh, so yes, that is a, a, a benefit, but it has to be at the, the, those lands have to be at the right elevation to, to do that and to you know, give volume to the river um, when it does flood. Thank you. Last question. Swanson Trig, is that a possibility? It is mostly wetlands. So if we were to dig it out and develop a detention basin in there, we would have to buy wetland credits or develop wetlands elsewhere. Wetland credits run about $100,000 an acre. And I think the current mitigation rate is for every acre of wetland that you remove, you have to buy an acre and a half elsewhere, depending upon the quality. If it's a high quality wetland, then you have to buy four acres for every acre. So that detention just becomes very, very expensive once you're adding those costs into it as well. Thank you, David. <laughs> thank you, David, and thank you, Heather, for your presentation. So on to strategic plan, fiscal years 2017 to 2021, progress report number seven. Yeah, we're gonna have uh, some uh, <laughs> department heads, supervisors come up here and sit at the table that are gonna speak. Um, sent out uh, report number seven um, today, copy at your desk, we'll post it online. Get it out to those that participated in the uh, uh, creation of the strategic, uh, strategic plan. We did it in 2017 so they can uh, stay up to date. So um, running through a quick PowerPoint here, uh, grouped it a little different this time. Um, basically took uh, the initiatives that we had and put them in three different groups completed, ongoing, substantially completed, and then ongoing. So uh, the format, just a reminder, um, we have a project lead assigned to each in initiative. Uh, it's one page, and then we have action steps underneath it. Um, we look at what we've uh, completed internally and render our opinion as far as a percentage completed on each, and then we assign it either action step completed, progress made, or no progress to date. I would say a lot of these are ongoing. So like communications, flood mitigation, <clears throat> they may be marked complete in here because we completed those listed action steps, but obviously we'll be continuing to work on that as long as the village exists. So uh, 24 total initiatives uh, came out of the 2017 effort. We've uh, are of the opinion that 13 are completed or ongoing, um, six substantially completed, so over 70% of um, the action steps listed and then five um, less than that are we're continuing to work on. So I'll run you through just really quick some of the highlights of those completed. Um, one one was um, improved communication. So I mean since the um, we created this, you know, we're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, we've got next door in place now, redid the website um, that has a transparency portal. So those are some big things. Uh, 1.5 is released to the fire department. Um, last year, uh, the village board approved image trend as far as their uh, records management software. Um, also brought a new ambulance billing provider on board and have got the fire prevention bureau all on electronic devices, so no more uh, paper and pencil for them. Uh, the financial policies, um, Brian did a good job getting those whipped into shape. We review them every year, included in the annual uh, budget process. So we take a look at them through that process. Um, provide the board any updates or suggested improvements that we think um, need to be made. That rolls into the um, fiscal contingency plan. Again, uh, created that shortly after the strategic planning process, and we bring that, take a look at that every year. Um, there's certain thresholds um, that are in there that if they're hit, then we implement that plan. So again, it's brought up during the budget process and reviewed with department heads. Um, the pensions, uh, conservatively fund them. Again, uh, another policy. Um, we had reduced our return assumption from um, seven and a half down to seven, uh, which is a step towards being conservative. Also, when we receive the two um, amounts, either the um, actuarial assumption or the actual performance, we always fund the more conservative of the two, so the, the higher of the two. Let's continue to do that. Uh, pedestrian and uh, bicyclist movements, um, Jack um, spearheaded the Blue Ribbon Committee, uh, which came out with 
a plethora of recommendations as far as improved mobility around town. Those have been implemented. Um, some have been already implemented um, and marked off the list. Um, the suggestions are considered when we go through the budget process, including the capital plan. Um, David and Tracy are working them into the comp plan. Um, that's making its way through the process right now, so pretty good improvement on that. Um, Heather just talked about uh, flood mitigation, uh, parkway tree program, and basically just infrastructure in the parkway. Um, Public Works um, has a good handle on that, have replacement schedules in place, um, able to track uh, um, where they're at with things as far as hydro uh, replacement or painting, parkway trees that need to be updated, um, the signs that have been updated. So City Works has played a big role into that as far as being able to track where we're at in the process, how much it's costing us, setting priorities. Um, so good, good process made or progress made. Uh, the Wi-Fi um, and fiber uh, village facilities uh, are all connected. Um, we've got Zion um, connected through two different channels, through um, fiber and then also wireless is up and running now as it relates to dispatch consolidation and then continue to just um, keep the dialogue open with the schools, the park district, the library, if there's an opportunity uh, for them to jump on board and help them out. Uh, the public safety, that was really the VOP, the Visitor Oriented Policing Unit, so that's um, up and running, has been successful. Uh, shared communications and dispatch, um, we've brought Zion and Beach Park Fire on board uh, since the strategic plan is created. We participate, participated and still participating in the Lake County 911 regional consolidation process, so that's nearing an end. Um, they're reviewing the um, final report implementation plan, then it'll be up to each um, participating agency on that and how they want to carry that forward. Um, we are continuing to speak with the county as far as uh, some potential uh, partnerships there um, so that um, dialogue continues. Also the county's out right now for an RFP for um, CAD, records management and jail management. So um, our records management in CAD is probably about three years off from being replaced so hopefully there's an op opportunity there to um, get on the same platform as some other um, partner agencies in the county, uh, which will help with further consolidation, sharing information. Uh, Body Warren Camera Program, Police Department got that implemented, has been great, very happy with it. And then obviously Walton Plaza um, was built, got that dedicated um, last year, last summer. So, so those are the completed, the substantially completed here. Like I said, there's six, so I'm gonna let the folks down in front of you, each one of the leads responsible for that, touch on that briefly and then get in a little more detail with those that are ongoing so all right to kick it off our first one we have is 1.3 which was to refine performance measurements to improve village service delivery so this is one that's kind of gone through some changes since we started so we kind of had a vision originally of what we wanted to do for this one and what we wanted to track um, we kind of got to a point where we didn't want to just track just for the sake of tracking measurements. We're trying to kind of really key down on what we're looking at. And one of the things we used with this was to track the plan itself. So really our end goal is to complete this plan or to complete our strategic priorities. So what this performance measure does essentially is it tracks our performance against the plan. Um, so when we kind of look at where we're at, we're currently now over 75% substantially complete on this plan. Um, and we continue to work towards these goal-oriented, um, task-oriented measures. So rather than just metrics, we're looking at actual um, inclusions. So that's essentially what the plan is. I guess that's the objective for tonight, right? Should I take my hand from that? <laughs> Take as long as you like. <laughs> um, you have to work with these people tomorrow. So. That, that's right. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind, everybody. Um, 2.1 is, you know, sort of ironic. A plan for economic development is never really done, but we have it in the over 70% category, and that's because we're making active progress on most of the key elements. The two that I wanted to talk about, one has to do with PACE, so I'll just defer that to a later uh, objective that's specific to PACE. The one that is not PACE related has to do with manufacturing. And so it, it addresses uh, scheduling visits with, with manufacturers, which Trustee Hood and I are about to do. Every year we update our list of top employers, over 150 employees and top sales tax generators, and we are hitting that list very shortly. Um, they had the, 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 the Tri-State Business Park, where a lot of those reside, has had an active year. Um, they, Centerpoint is, of course, fully leased with uh, Luxor Furniture, 
ALEC opened its new 30,000 square foot headquarters building. Um, Handy Foil and Teva, two vacancies that I'm hoping don't last too long. We have, have seen some quite a bit of leasing interest on them, but Teva is very specific to the pharma industry. And Handy Foil, um, actually we have an inquiry active right now on that, so I do think that may be proceeding pretty nicely. Um, so as we, as we get out and identify issues, we'll, we'll be back to talk about those, but really the, the key point is to start the conversation with those, and, and that's part of our plan for the next three to six months until we do this again. Uh, three point four. Thank you. Four. That's. All right. Thank you. My uh, item here for three point four is enhance the multi-year capital improvement plan to identify other key needs and opportunities for funding enhancements. So at this time, there's several action steps that we've completed. But what we're working towards now is to get the metrics that demonstrate that when we invest in capital infrastructure, that it's actually improving our infrastructure going forward. So trying to um, quantify that so that it's representative can be somewhat difficult in some um, aspects different infrastructure is easy to measure like the quality of your roads or the PCI indices um, but whether or not a water main breaks may not directly relate to whether or not that water main is of a good quality so um, we're still developing those um, it's on my radar I hope to come back with more progress next time Comprehensive land use plan update. Um, we have been working with Camaros for just shy of a year now. Um, to date, we have the maps. There are two major components of the plan, the maps for both the existing land use and the future land use, and then the text uh, that supports all of those as, as well as develops all of the plans throughout the village. Um, to date, we've had the maps go before the planning and zoning board, had a few tweaks that needed to happen. Those have come back and forth. Um, and then the text portions of the uh, plan have been uh, reviewed by staff. We sent them back for a few uh, amendments. Uh, those just came back in from Camaros last week, so we'll be reviewing those, their changes and hopefully getting those to the uh, Planning and Zoning Board for their review by the end of the year. Once we get those two portions of the plan put together, uh, we'll run it past the Planning and Zoning Board one final time as a complete set and then bring it up to you as the village board for the final plan adoption. So hopefully early 2020. Thank you, David. Good evening. Uh, research opportunities to implement electronic citations. Uh, we're, as Mr. Mutes mentioned, uh, the, uh, the county is uh, looking at a new records management system and a new CAD system, as are we. And so we are also in a, in a, in a position to kind of wait where they go with their CAD system. That, that may lead us to a, an opportunity to uh, have a, uh, a CAD system uh, with them, which would lead to a records management system, uh, a new records management system in the Gurney Police Department. Um, and again, some of this is predicated on the court system in the Lake County Court. Uh, they're doing a, uh, a new case management system internally in the courts. And, and so bef as they move through that process, they're in year one of a two to three year process uh, until the chief judge can approve accepting e-citations uh, at Lake County. And until, until that happens, um, we're continuing to monitor the situ situation and uh, we just wanna slow down and make sure that we make the, the best decision fiscally uh, for Gurney. So thank you. So boutique and small businesses, the, um, the efforts with the chamber have really stepped up this year. Um, a couple of things coming up in the holiday season. Small Business Saturday, which is a Saturday after Thanksgiving. We'll be headed again this year for the second time by the chamber. That's where we reach out to between 15 and probably 25 independent businesses and they offer something special like free gift wrapping or <coughs> you know, cookies with the purchase or whatever. Um, the village had headed it up for several years. The chamber really is, that's an opportunity that I wanted to encourage them to take um, and they have. And so um, they'll be heading that up again this year. Um, it, it ties in nicely to our holiday train, which is December 2nd this year. Some of the businesses collect food and then it's, you know, it's, 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 provided to the Northern Illinois Food Bank at that, uh, at that event. A um, couple other things happening at the end of this year, another co-op campaign, Maureen mentioned it with the, um, so whereas our campaign with her, with VLC, is really regionally focused, we also do this SBS 
um, with the chamber, which is very local. So as we move now with Alpha Media coming into town, I think we have an opportunity. So we, we've got our holiday events lined up. Um, the team will be meeting Maureen and um, Carl Wurzler from Alpha Media, Randy Ibertowski from Gurney Mills, to figure out how we can take advantage of this three-year trade agreement that we negotiated with them to promote both small and large. So I think we, what we have, it's been a few months, so we'll just quickly re, you know, revisit it. So we, we negotiated three months of in-kind advertising up to $127,000 value each year. What that buys us is a weekly radio segment, as well as spot banks, 40 throughout the month that we can use for whatever, whatever, whatever purpose we want. So on those weekly segments, we'll probably invite in Great Wolf and Maureen Reedy and our, our big partners. On the spot banks, I think we'll do more of what we've done on East Grand, which is more of a local, this you know, January is fitness month. February is dining out month. Uh, March, and, March and April and May is improve your house month, things like that. So we'll, we'll, we'll really tailor it to the, to the small businesses. Um, on an ongoing basis, I think that will avail, you know, en enable us to really be, be local and regional at the same time. And the timing is perfect because it, it basically, so our, our plan is to set an, a media calendar. This is something that Jack and I have talked about for a long time. So as we go through 2020, we will have decided in advance mm -hmm. what we will be promoting each month, each quarter, each season, uh, and then the partners can filter in accordingly and work with us to, to accomplish that. Okay, so now we'll transition to those that we continue to work on, but may have not, may not have made as much progress as some of the other ones, so. All right, thank you. Um, much like economic development, recruitment, and workforce planning is an ongoing never-ending effort, um, and so some of the things that uh, remain to be a challenge um, are, you know, getting a cohesive recruitment plan in place. Um, part of that, I think, could benefit a lot through um, some branding of what we want to be as an employer, uh, utilizing social media much more effectively. Um, you know, that's obviously not my area of, of expertise, um, but tapping in and looking at some other communities that have done this, um, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, one of the things I will be bringing forward during our, bud our budget process will also be a full online applicant tracking and implementation system. We have a small one with our new um, financial software, um, but it is not very flexible. And um, so it has not been meeting our needs, or my needs, as a re as recruitment basis. So um, I will be looking to bring forward a, a whole, a, a kind of a whole system for that process. And I think that will definitely help reach the millennials, the Gen Zs coming down the pipeline in, in a few years, um, and just be more mobile friendly, be more um, you know, app, app, app based um, out there in the social media. Um, another element could also be, and this is something I'm kind of kicking around, is having, um, through that process, having a dedicated um, employment HR kind of centralized website. Maybe not, it doesn't exist out there permanently in the, on the web, but if someone does click through a job ad, they can come in and kind of see all, see all of our benefits, see some videos, do things like that. There's another local community, one of my colleagues, they've done that and they find that to be a very helpful element in getting the word out about them as an employer um, and driving people to apply for their jobs. So, um, and I think through that, you know, you get more applicants, you get better diversity. You know, some of our applicant pools have been very limited lately um, and it's just trying to reach an overwhelmed amount of social media, you know, prospects. Um, how do we make ourselves stand out? So I think that'll be something that um, it's definitely part of that ongoing uh, workforce uh, succession planning. Uh, but overall, I think we, we've come strides from where we were. Um, every year we use, uh, have a spreadsheet that I present to each department. Um, they utilize it to kind of analyze, you know, who's retiring. I use a red uh, stoplight system, red light, yellow light, green light. You know, red light within the next 12 months. Green light or yellow light, one to three years. Green light down the road a ways. So I think it helps departments visualize 
who's in their um, workforce. They don't always remember when they were hired, but when you start looking at where they are in relation to being eligible to retire, it kind of hits home a little bit harder. So we've been using that as a, as a good tool to kind of get through that process and start the plans of how do we replace that person? You know, who's coming next? So I think we've, we've worked through that quite well over the last few years. So, um, but yeah, so those are my, my targets for coming up and keeping this moving forward. Thank you. Who's next? I'm next. <laughs> Jackson. All right. So for a 1.4 uh, to improve business processes village wide. So for these strategic plans, one of the goals of the plan was that we come before you for our victories and come before you for some of our uh, challenges. So this was one that for almost about two years, it has stalled out. Um, but I'm proud to report on some recent developments. I'll kind of walk the group through. So when this started, uh, the idea was we created um, a Gurney Process Innovation Committee. Um, this, the idea behind it was that we look at business practices at ways we can improve them. So a couple of staff members, we actually went through training, uh, earned our Lean Six Sigma government black belts, um, looked at kind of how we can look at processes and make it a better process. Uh, we ended up starting out with three subcommittees, a paper purchasing, a customer service improvements, and building maintenance subcommittees. Um, so I'll kind of update real quick on what each of these three have recent had developments. So for the paper purchasing, uh, we looked at kind of how each department was responsible for how they purchased paper. Um, we were doing a lot of redundancy from department to department, where every department was kind of going through the same process, hunting deals, um, buying from different vendors, we're all paying different pricing. So what we've been working on is centralizing, so kind of using some of the same vendors, same pricing. Um, and one of the recommendations that came out of it was to look at including paper purchase with our copier contracts. So that essentially as we need paper, we have a set negotiated price, so we're not constantly hunting coupons for paper. Uh, with the latest copier contract that was approved at the last board meeting, that will be included once we uh, work through our current stock of paper. Um, so kind of that, that's one, I guess, victory that we're getting close to their recommendations. The second one was for our customer service and how we handled online inquiries. Uh, this group met looking at how we kind of routed different things. This was where the CRM was sort of thought of. Um, so it's been a multi-year work in progress. Um, and this one, again, a victory at the latest board meeting uh, where we did get it approved for the contract and we're working with GovQA on the next steps uh, to getting GovQA in to streamline how we respond to e-services. <coughs> uh, the third one we had was our building maintenance. So looking at how we maintain buildings uh, throughout the village. So essentially, we all have similar problems. We have aging infrastructure, the buildings are getting older, um, and we have different in-house capabilities to manage it. Um, so this one definitely, I think, more than the other ones really has struggled. Um, the lead on this did leave the organization, so that did kind of hurt a bit. Um, but we're looking at how we're sharing internally of resources, working together, sharing expertise, using public works uh, expertise for things um, internally here has helped us quite a bit. And then what we're working towards is staff is looking at sort of like a building facility master plan in the long term and looking at kind of what's our, our facility needs and how we approach that in the future. So that's one of the areas that we're looking at, but this one definitely um, hasn't had a ton of movement. Okay, the next two, one has to do with East Grand and the other has to do with Pace, as we talked about earlier. Um, we just wrapped up our second season on the farmer's market. Uh, we'll be sending out a survey monkey to see what the residents and businesses thought about that and, and whether they feel it's beneficial. As I think you know, it's part of our effort to rejuvenate that area. Construction costs are high. Rents are not particularly high in that area. And so this was identified as a first step that you bring people back. And as you bring people back, the businesses start to see that it's a place that, you know, it's happening and rents go up and it's sort of the cycle starts to, to lead toward redevelopment. So this is a, these are, these are interim steps. These are, these are not the end goal. Um, however, in the face of ongoing construction, uh, I think it is a good place for us to be helping. Um, so really two, two ways in particular that we helped with, with promotions this year for the business community on East Grand. We did the farmer's market. We promoted it, tried to do a lot of sharing of the local businesses' you know, own posts. Um, and we also worked with XLC. So this was sort of a precursor to our Alpha Media contract that we, they did some in-kind trade advertising. So we actually really co cooperatively came up, came up with a campaign that was the thrill of the hunt. 
So you'll remember when the panel came in and did their findings, they, they talked about it, and, and we all know it's true. It's the kind of place you go on East Grand and you might find a unique find at a thrift store or at the, at the Habitat Restore. So the thrill of the hunt was a way to put a very positive spin on that, on that element of it. So about 10 businesses signed up. We kept the buy-in cost extremely low at $50, and the Village and Alpha Media really shared the cost for three months in the summer and three <laughs> months in the fall. So that actually elicited more participation than really anything else we've done. So I, I think that's something that we should continue as we go forward with Alpha. Um, so those two things really were the promotional end of, end of, the, end of the spectrum on East Grand. Um, appreciated the village board's uh, support of the landscaping. So that's basically done until we get through construction. When, when that is done, we'll go back and finish up the final piece. Um, I have to really um, sh provide some Kudos and credit to our, our new village engineer, um, Heather, has made some progress with IDOT in terms of conveying some common sense solutions in my book to help ease the congestion, you know, reopening some lanes, um, interacting with the engineers at IDOT to say, well, how can we figure this out? This is going on f for a protracted period of time. And we've and the mayor, the mayor has, has conveyed some of that to our legislators as well. So I, I get the feeling that the businesses on East Grand feel that we're in their corner and that's really what we want it to be. So that, that's really important. U-Haul, um, um, as you know, we, we, we've been waiting now for a few years. They are in with plans. I think maybe you probably saw that in the Projects in Progress report. They are in with plans for build out of self-storage for, I would say about two thirds of the existing building, the handy Andy 20 year vacant building. Um, and of course they bought the motels behind them. They are re-roofing the motels, doing some other things I, I think as well to address some long standing property maintenance concerns. So that's a, that's a win and you know, we really are, are glad to see that happening. Um, it'll take some time to fully realize that vision. You won't, you won't drive by and say, oh, it looks different on the outside. That's not this phase, that might be the next phase, but they're, but they're heading that direction. Um, and, they've been, and they've been a good partner. They, they helped us with the farmer's market. Um, lastly, the other big property that I know you all are interested in is the one at, at the southeast corner of Belle Plaine and Grand. There, you've seen conceptual plans for renovations there until they continue you know, finish leasing the space and bring in more revenue, um, they probably aren't going to pull the trigger on a comprehensive facade renovation. Um, I think at such point as they do bring in a new revenue generator, that may be an opportunity for them to do that. Until then, um, they are doing things like putting up a new monument sign, which the uh, PZB just approved, and it will be a nice enhancement, very nice enhancement. And, and the tenants are thrilled. Um, so with that, I will, I guess I'll, okay, so Pace. Um, sorry. So Pace, um, I think the, the, the issue here, uh, just a couple things. To, re to remind you, there have been several wins, um, sm small but mighty wins. Um, the sidewalk and shelters, you all remember on Route 21 when we worked with, with Six Flags. The Sam's Club shelter is, it appears that af after the Hunt Club intersection is done, the pad is poured and we're expecting a new shelter there as well. So that'll be three new shelters in the last two years, two to three years. Um, new garbage receptacles. It's really exciting. That's uh, in, our, in some of our higher traffic locations. Great Wolf is exploring a dedicated loop, much like we did for Six Flags. Um, they need to provide some route, uh, some shift information, like where employees are coming, where do, they, where do they live, who rides the bus, what times do they get on and off, things like that. Um, we met earlier this year with Rocky Donahue. Rocky is the new, as of March, I think, permanent um, director of PACE. So we had the opportunity to convey to him and to Linda Soto, who's the Lake County representative on the PACE board, um, that we'd like to see Grand Avenue become a, a major arterial with, over, with equipment that allows the PACE buses to override the signals. I know we've talked about that for a while, but I feel like this year between their receptiveness to that plan, um, an opportunity that we had to convey this to the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, um, to convey that plan. And of course, we heard Hank talking about it tonight. I think his idea is more of a dedicated shuttle, but anything we can do to speed Grand Avenue buses, I think will help get us to that goal. So that continues to be um, a, a topic of conversation. The last thing, um, we've had an opportunity to participate in a couple of, so Lake County as a whole is putting an emphasis on public transportation, Abbott, AbV, um, Lake County partners have all partnered to add reverse commute trains from the city. 
So it's a shared funding arrangement where there's now at least one express train going the opposite way, the idea being you could live in Chicago and work in Lake County. And I think that helps the region. Millennials want to live in the city. Our employers need them. That's one way to get them here. We only know one person that's going to be talking about this, right, Chris? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, in preparing to, to make some comments tonight, I went through the success indicators for uh, Initiative 5.4. Uh, a couple of those were the availability of 100 megabit uh, internet service for residents. 100 megabit download speeds are available from both Comcast and AT&T currently, which was not the case when we put this in. Also, availability of gigabit internet service for businesses. Again, both Comcast and AT&T now offer services above one gigabit. Um, for commercial accounts, there are a few other providers that offer fiber services, either as a wholesaler or a reseller, who are using the uh, incumbents' networks. Um, looking at new investment by incumbent service providers leading to higher levels of service. Um, one of the changes that's happened over the last few years is the addition of the Comcast retail site where our residents don't have to travel in order to get some assistance uh, in those areas. Um, we also continue to see a lot of right-of-way activity for both Comcast and AT&T. Another success indicator was the addition of new internet service providers. Um, we really haven't seen much in that area except in the commercial space. If I would uh, characterize the residential space, we've maybe seen a little bit of a pullback there where there were some wireless providers that were doing uh, residential service. And overall, we've seen a, a decrease in that area. And the last uh, success indicator we had was positioning the village and its partners to take advantage of grant programs at the federal and state level. And maybe when we look at the, the actions here that we've taken, um, we can talk a little bit about where we are with uh, what's available in the grant landscape. Um, under the action steps, uh, promoting the use of our right-of-way while being good stewards was one of the things that uh, was identified as an action step. I point to two actions that the board has taken over the last few years. Uh, in both uh, 2017 and 2018, we've moved to bring 5G wireless uh, more readily to our residents through the use of the install and operate wireless equipment on light poles right-of-way and other village property as well as a right-of-way agreement for MCI Metro working on behalf of Verizon for installation of fiber optic cable in the right-of-way. Um, when you hear about 5G and all the wonderful things that it will bring, uh, that part of that <laughs> is predicated on they need a way to connect all those towers and bring that level of broadband service. And uh, we have been accommodating in both cases on those ordinances. Action step number two is reaching out to local businesses to understand and capture their priorities with related to bandwidth. Ellen's done a fantastic job of uh, working with this as part of her retention visits um, and specifically can cite some of the work that's happened in Grand Tri-State Business Park to help make that more attractive to people. And uh, all the, the credit goes to Ellen on that. Not at all. No. Not in my opinion. Um, inventory public access, uh, assets and information available valuable to the private sector uh, makes that data available to a greater extent. I think we kind of took a different approach on this one, and I would point to all the work that Jack and everybody else did on the monopole towers. So we had assets there that were valuable to these uh, wireless providers that we were never going to market in an effective manner or had not marketed in an effective manner. And uh, through some public-private partnership and some creative thinking, um, those assets are now much more available through the uh, agreement that was worked out with Vogue Tower. Uh, action step number four was identifying the uh, federal and state grants. Um, we've looked at this a couple times in the past. I took a fresh look at it again. Uh, if you look at the federal grant opportunities that are out there, they focus on rural and low-income areas. Um, we don't qualify as a rural or low-income area. You do have some geographical areas, such as Appalachia, that have gotten certain grants in regards to this. Um, but as an example, the Community Connected Grants, uh, in their Q&A on that, they have what is an eligible area, a rural area lacking any existing broadband speed of at least 10 megabits downstream and 1 megabit upstream. 
we do not have a case to be made that that's not available to our residents. Um, we have benefited from the Illinois Department of Innovation and Technologies participation in the Broadband Technologies Opportunities Grant Program, BTOP. Uh, several million dollars were awarded to Illinois. It uh, went right into the Illinois Century Network, and we work with the Illinois Century Network. They're our internet service provider. Um, so we in benefited indirectly from that grant program. Uh, recently at the state level, ICN has, uh, the Illinois Century Network has been allocated funds to make uh, K through 12 broadband access available at no uh, broadband service charge cost to schools uh, statewide. Historically, the schools have participated in the federal E-rate program, which effectively subsidized broadband for the schools. So in a cooperative manner, there wasn't much incentive on the school part because to work with us might jeopardize their uh, E-rate funding that they would get. Now that ICN uh, has become a more cost-effective option for them, that may open up some opportunities as we move forward. Um, the one active grant program I found that we might be able to qualify for was through the National Science Foundation. Uh, they were doing uh, what I would call pure research plays on how broadband could uh, affect different aspects of uh, everyday life but really they have partnered with major universities on that. In Illinois, awardees are, have been the Illinois Institute of Technology, Northwestern University, University of Chicago, University of Illinois at Chicago, and University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So if we were able to strike up a relationship with one of them, there may be a grant opportunity there down the road. Um, overall, in regards to broadband, um, we started this initiative in the era of Google Fiber and all kinds of wonderful sounding promises. I can tell you that Google is not interested in Google Fiber at this point. That has been a money losing proposition for them and they've pulled back even with some agreements that were in place for deployment. Um, really the landscape that you're looking at, uh, the major players are uh, solidifying their positions. If I would characterize the, the FCC over the last uh, two or three years, They've decidedly swung against uh, local participation in broadband efforts. They have actively struck down efforts nationwide in that regard. And uh, you may be able to get some indication of that as you see that AT&T and Comcast are two of the largest lobbying contributors on a federal level out of any industry nationwide. Their, interest, uh, their interests are being protected by those lobbying efforts and it makes us an uphill climb for somebody who wants to run against the, go against the stream on that. But with that, I'd, I'd certainly be glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Chris. So just uh, wrapping it up here, obviously continue to plug away at those that we have not yet completed. Um, next progress report will be included in the upcoming budget, so in March we'll have that. And then, um, you know, be thinking about uh, the next go around and updating this. So we're looking at probably late 2020, early 2021. Take a look at the mission, vision, values. Are they still uh, applicable to where we're at at that point in time? And obviously update the initiatives. Just a reminder for those that weren't here in 2015, kind of the process we used. Uh, Village Board, we brought in a consultant. Uh, Village Board had one-on-one -on -one interviews with that consultant uh, to talk about their priorities. Um, then had a um, survey that went out uh, with the internal uh, management leadership team, a couple focus groups, and then brought um, village staff and the board together for a one-day retreat um, to uh, sift through all the ideas and see what came up to the top. So that's what we used um, last time around. Uh, from staff's perspective, worked out okay, uh, but obviously we're open to any suggestions. So as I said, over the next, um, next year or so, be thinking about that because it'll be coming down the pipeline. So, with that being said, that's all we had on the Thanks for tonight. Um, any questions or comments? Trustee Garner. On the issue of diversity in the village, I'm happy to see that we have made some progress on that, um, especially in the police department. Um, I think it worked out well. I haven't heard anything one way or the other. So I commend you for that, those efforts. And then secondly, um, I would just like to say that, you know, it, it, I've always said it's very important to keep diversity on the table. 
if you're serious about creating diversity. So it makes me really happy to see that, um, you know, I didn't have to ask for it this time. It's actually right here in Rangers. And uh, you spoke to it, you know, Vicky spoke to it. <coughs> so it means we're actively working on it. And that's a great thing. I mean, it, it's very important that um, in a community that, that says it's a community of opportunity, that we reflect that in, in our hiring. And, um, you know, it's not about how it got the way it is, but it's more about how we get it to where it needs to be. And so I would just like to publicly say that, you know, I'm proud that um, we made a move in a positive direction on that. And I just, my hope is that we will keep doing that in the future. I think it works best for, for our town. Um, the other thing, uh, as a suggestion, you know, one of the things that I have found in working on diversity with District 56 is, while it is a difficult thing to hire, to create diversity, if you will, for a lot of complex reasons, which we don't need to get into, but I think that um, uh, it can also be very simple. Um, you know, if you know somebody who knows somebody, so maybe, and, and I don't know if we have a, uh, incentive or reward uh, in recommending good, good candidates. It may be that simple, you know, and you get a stack of them over time and then you draw from them when you need it, and, you know, when somebody retires or this or that. Um, we don't have to make it real difficult or, or complex thing. I just think it's very important and, and I think, uh, you know, it's been proven time and time again, a diverse workforce comes up with uh, many more creative ideas and better ideas than one-sided situation. So, um, hats off to you guys. Keep up the good work. I appreciate it. Thanks, Craig. Anything else? Looks like we're all out. I could just say that this is a great opportunity. I think easily say on behalf of the board that we're just very thankful for each one of you. That it's obvious that we have nights like this. That. I don't have to worry about going to sleep at night. You guys can lose sleep, and I'm doing great. At 30,000 feet, things are great. And I know from our residents, the same thing is true, is that uh, I don't think the residents don't know how great they've got it. And that's the unique opportunity, I think, as a board that we have with you guys, is that we get to see you in action. And uh, can just really be thankful for the team that, with uh, Pat and you guys, um, have been put together. So I know Christy say the same thing, and she does all the time. So. I'll uh, say the same thing to you guys. It's thank you. Thank you for all the work you do. And on that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? <laughs> say aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed? We're adjourned. Thanks.